John chapter 5, we're going to begin in the first verse. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the Word of God. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, Do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. Immediately the man became well, and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, It is the Sabbath, and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, He who made me well was the one who said to me, Pick up your pallet and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Pick up your pallet and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin any more, so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your inspired, inerrant, infallible word. May it bring life to us as we hear it this day. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. John chapter 5 begins with the record here of the healing of a lame man. But this is much more than a story about healing. This miracle of healing, and that's what it was, acts like a trigger point that really brings intense opposition and hostility from the religious leaders towards Jesus from this point on. These leaders were gatekeepers of a damning religious system which resulted in rejection of the very Messiah that they said they wished for. All who followed them, the leaders, became sons of hell. Later uh, in our service we'll see more of that. But we've already seen it in Matthew 23 when the entire chapter was read and we see the shocking, stunning statements of Jesus towards those who were the religious people. Summed up in Matthew 23, 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. There it's speaking to the leaders in context. The leaders of Jerusalem who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children. He's addressing them, but he's speaking of the children. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hand gathers her chicks under her wings and you, that's the leaders, were not willing. You were unwilling. You didn't allow for that. Let me ask you this question today. How important is truth to you? When we look at the history of the church and we see the reformation that took place in the 16th century led by Martin Luther and others, uh, Swingley in Switzerland, and there were others in England. There were forerunners. There were uh, great men and women of God who laid down their lives for the truth that we now enjoy so freely. 
But let me ask you, how important is truth to you? And when we look back in time, when exactly did the Roman Catholic Church so stray that they were now no longer able to be called a Christian church, one who embraced uh, the gospel? Well, I believe there was many, uh, many errors through the history of the church, just as there's errors in our own day. And yet, it was when the Roman Catholic Church announced its anathema. If you know that word, it's a Greek word found in the uh, book of Galatians chapter 1 where the Apostle Paul wrote and said, anyone who changes the gospel or brings a different one to them, even if they're an angel, if it's us, if it's we as an apostle, even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim, should pre preach any other gospel, let him be anathema, anathema in English, which means to be under the eternal curse of God. He said, that's true of me, it's true of an angel, you have an angel that comes to you, doesn't matter if your name is Joseph, doesn't matter if your name is Joseph Smith, doesn't matter what your name is, you might be Brian, you might be Bartholomew, you might be Mildred, doesn't matter. You take that angel and by its britches you kick it out the door of the church. We don't want to listen to someone who's going to bring a false gospel. And so it was at the Council of Trent in that 16th century in opposition to Luther and the Reformers where I believe the Roman Catholic Church became a false church because although they got many other things right, they put an anathema on the gospel. That gospel being justification by faith alone. Not only that proclamation, but anyone who believes it. To this day, it's been unrescinded. The anathema of Rome and is against me this very day for believing and proclaiming justification by faith alone. It was at that point, I believe, the Roman Catholic Church became a false church. I realize this is stuff that goes on the internet. It's brave to say it, I guess, but it's just true. But how important is truth to you? Jesus had cleansed the temple earlier in chapter 2 of this great gospel. Now what he was about to do was going to put uh, the religious uh, leaders on notice in a very strong way. And after this incident, we're going to read, they wanted him dead. In fact, this was a common occurrence. Jesus did things that made a lot of people glad and a lot of people mad. And the people loved it, a lot of them, but some sided with the religious leaders. And they were the ones who yelled for his crucifixion. Crucify him, crucify him, spurred on by these same religious leaders. Later on in John, we'll see that part of the words of those leaders was, he's sympathetic with the Samaritans. You remember we've already read in the previous chapter of Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman. And later on in John chapter 8, verse 48, the leaders call him a Samaritan. He's like a mixed breed. And he has a demon. That was over and over again in the ministry. Uh, the words of the leaders against Christ. In John chapter 7, 30, verse 44. In John chapter 8, 20, 48, 52, 59. You can look it up in your own time. The hostility of these men who were leaders was uh, absolute. They wanted him dead. Now, this particular healing is uh, very strategic on Jesus' part. Healing was a common thing that Jesus was doing. And he was not just healing over a period of 17 months as people got a little bit of a cure and then a little bit more as time went on. There were immediate, definite miracles to the point that no one could deny God was using Jesus in an absolutely miraculous way. That was the testimony we've already seen in John chapter 3. Remember Nicodemus? He said, no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Even those who weren't absolutely sure who this was yet could not deny the miracles of Jesus. So let's look at the text. John chapter 5 says in verse 1, After these things there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. This feast is unidentified. But uh, the Old Testament outlines three specific feasts that all men were required to attend. We don't know exactly which one. That's not the point of the passage here, so it's not stated. 
And so these uh, feasts were still in, uh, in, in orbit. They were still commanded by God despite the apostasy of the present system that Jesus was exposing. They were required to go to the feast. Look at verse 2. Now there was, uh, there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool which is called in Hebrew Bethesda having five porticos. Now it's Nehemiah chapter 3 that identifies uh, the gate here as a place where sheep were brought for sacrifice and it was still standing at the time of Jesus. Many historians in early antiquity could identify this particular gate. Today we're absolutely not sure exactly which gate that was, but certainly at the time of Jesus they were. The word uh, and the name Bethesda means house of mercy and based on this particular passage and others many hospitals are called Bethesda and it arises from this text. Many hospitals have been named after this place even in our own day. Bethesda Veterans Hospital, Bethesda Hospital and so it goes on over and over in many cities throughout the world. Five porticos or porches what was here was a large pool that had a roof to keep the sun off people. We understand that, right? Here we crave and co covet uh, covered parking for our cars. Well, there if you're going to uh, lay out because you're not too well, it's great to have a covered roof. And there were five uh, places where they could do that under this uh, uh, covering by this large pool. Now remember this, while there were doctors in that time, Luke was the gospel writer, was a doctor. There were no hospitals back then. There wasn't a Bethesda hospital. There was just this place, this pool, where people who were sick gathered. And that's a sensible place to gather, especially if you believe the superstition that was around this place. We'll come to that. Verse 3. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered. Now, if you've got a very good Bible in front of you, you might notice that there is a bracket after the word withered, and it goes on for quite some time to the end of verse 4. And so, in brackets is this phrase, Waiting for the moving of the waters, for an angel of the Lord <coughs> went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. Now, what scholars believe is happening at this point is a scribe in ancient times, but not in the first century, long time after, is explaining to the readers what's happening. And that's been inserted into the text. And that's why there's these uh, brackets. In fact, I wonder if anyone here has the uh, NIV in front of you. Anyone can raise a hand for a moment and just say, I've got the NIV, the nearly infallible version. Is that what it means? <laughs> New International Version. No, you're all well trained and probably have something else. So some of them, so, yeah, but you're pointing to your phone. You can find it on your phone. <laughs> I actually had, uh, I was part of a class where someone who knew the issues here invited people with an NIV to read John chapter 5 and verse 4. And there was this stunned silence across the room because there was silence when that was the question because in the NIV there isn't a verse 4. It goes from the end of verse 3 to verse 5. And what you find on the internet, if you are in any way uh, looking for trouble, you can find it there. Uh, articles and videos, YouTube videos that say, look, look, we can't trust the modern translations. They, uh, they, they remove verses from the entire Bible. Look at John chapter 5 verse 4. There is no verse 4. These versions are corrupt. How many of you actually have heard that? That kind of argument. Alright, quite a number of you. Others? Okay, keep, keep, keep on trucking. That's great. But there's a lot of people that say the King James Version is the only version. And what they do is they get the King James Version, which has this long protracted reading, and then they get the NIV, which omits it. Now what the NIV does is put a little mark in the text, and, and then a footnote explains what's happening. Now, let me try and explain what is happening. I want to believe 
what the Bible says. Would you agree? You want to believe what the Bible says. But the question is, what does the Bible say? And for us who want to believe what the Bible says, we go to the original Greek text. But there's a problem, because there's two basic strands of text in Greek. Uh, one is called the Textus Receptus, which is the one that the King James Version is based on. Also, the New King James Version is based on that as well. And so you'd understand that the King James, New King James, it sounds alike. They base their translation of the text on the Receptus, the Textus Receptus, which is a very, very good translation, but I don't believe it's the best. The most authoritative ones that go back further, nearest to the first century, don't include this phrase that we find in verse 4. It's not there. We believe it's been put in by a kind scribe who was trying to help explain why certain things were happening in the text. And so if we say now, is something missing in the NIV? The answer is no. Because in the original text of the Greek, which I have before me here, there is no verse 4. Uh, it goes from verse 3 to verse 5. Now, why would that be? Well, just remember, the original Greek didn't have chapter and verse divisions. That's been added a long time later. Long, long, long time later. So that it might be helpful for us, so that when I say, let's go to John chapter 5, we're not spending 30 minutes trying to find the fifth chapter. Uh, try doing that with the book of Isaiah. Find the place where it says, He was wounded for our transgressions. Oh, good luck with that. It's going to take you a while to find it. After 40 minutes, when we've gone to seven other texts, you've eventually found that little place. But let's go to Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5 and 6, and you can find it very, very easily and quickly. So verse divisions are helpful. I don't believe they... Uh, are amazingly helpful because at times they can be a hindrance. We tend to focus on a verse or a chapter and not see uh, where they, they flow in the actual passage and sometimes we miss the context because we're looking at a verse rather than a passage. But that's, that's another story for another time. But in the original text there was no verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6. There was just the Greek text and the best, most authoritative text does not have the phrase that has not been found to be in the NIV. Does that make sense? So that's why when I ask a, a scholar like Dr. James White, who wrote a very helpful book on this called The King James Only Controversy, it's uh, his most famous book, over 100,000 copies have been sold over time, tremendous scholarly work and yet is very readable. I asked him, what do you think of the New King James Version? He said, it's a great translation of an inferior Greek text. And I had to think about that for a while, but eventually the penny dropped and I thought, oh, okay, it's a very good translation, but there are better Greek manuscripts upon which to make the trans translation. And those are the ones that the NIV, the ESV, the NASB, which is the one we're preaching from today, is based on. And so, I want you to be assured that the modern translators are not trying to hoodwink you and take verses out of the Bible. They want to go to the best original Greek text to find out what does it say and go directly there, rather than start with the King James or with what is an inferior, later Greek translation. I hope that's helpful. That's why you don't need to be fearful when you don't find verse 4 in your Bible. Like, what on earth is going on? I never knew that there are verses missing from the Bible. They're not. They just want to go to the original text. I hope that's helpful. The King James, this is how it reads. <coughs> verse 3. <coughs> in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool, and troubled the water, whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Here's how the NIV reads. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, and then it just goes to verse 5, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. Nothing's missing, nothing at all. 
the NASB includes the phrase but puts it in black brackets. Do you see now what's going on? They're including the phrase but they're marking it off saying this little phrase, this lengthy phrase actually, is uh, dubious and so we're going to put a footnote in at the bottom to explain what's going on. <clears throat> and the original would be part of what we're seeing in the newer translation. So, is all this important? Uh, not really, but the additional part that is in brackets in our NASB is not an essential element of the story. A superstition existed that an angel came and stirred up the waters. We don't know if that was uh, true. I tend to think it wasn't. It was a tradition and a scribe uh, believe that, but certainly the man believed that. Verse 7 makes that clear. We'll see that. He believed that tradition. We'll come to it. Let's go to verse 5. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. Now, it goes without saying, this is a massive amount of time. Some of you have not been alive for 38 years. Some of you are around 38 years. Some of you know 38 years is a long time. That's a long time to be sick. And he'd been there for a lengthy time. Verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, Do you wish to get well? I like the King James at this point. It says, Wilt thou be made whole? And I think it's a legitimate question. Someone who's been that long in that condition can get used to that condition. Is it still your hope? to be healed? Do you wish to get well? Do you want to be whole? Do you want to get well? Do you have any hope for healing still? Do you know there are some people who don't want to get well? This kind of is mysterious to those who are healthy, but there are some people who've been so long in that condition they've actually got used to it and they would be fearful if they were immediately, by way of a miracle, restored to full health. There's a lot to take on. For instance, in our society, there are benefits available for those who are sick. That wasn't always the case in human history, you know that? Uh, we live in a very privileged society. You get sick at work or even outside of work, there are benefits available to you. In ancient times, all you could do was lay by a pool and it might be a slim hope that you might get healed if you were able to get quickly into the water, but you'd go with that rather than just stay somewhere else. You had this slight, slight avenue for healing. But some people don't want to get well. They like the benefits they have, none of which would be available back then, and they don't like the thought of a healthy body. You know why? Because that would mean they have to work. Oh, I, I, I'm not sure. Work? Um, uh, that's a legitimate question of Jesus. Do you really want to get well? Uh, do you want to get whole? There's implications for being well. Let me ask you, do you want to be whole as a person? Do you want salvation? It's a good picture, isn't it? Some people don't want what we think everyone should want. And it's strange to us, but there are some people who think it might be preferable to go to hell. At least I'll be with my drinking buddies. <laughs> really? No, you'll be isolated. There'll be no camaraderie. It's not like the devil's ruling hell. He's under the punishment of God in hell as well, as are the angels who fell with him. Do you want to be whole? Do you want to be holy? Do you want to be righteous? Now, Jesus cared. He addressed the need. And this man was someone who was absolutely ignored by society. The idea was someone who is sick, and especially someone sick for that length of time, must be a huge, big, mega sinner. He's got to be. And Jesus talked with him and addressed his need. Do you want to get well? Talk to me. Do you want to get well? The man's answer is found in verse 7, which exposed his belief in that superstition. Verse 7, the sick man answered him, Sir, he obviously didn't know who Jesus was. There was a word of respect, a name of respect, Sir. Certainly not knowing who he was. Jesus hasn't identified himself at this point. Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Obviously, the man 
believe the superstition. Now, scholars have looked at this and they've speculated. Maybe the pool had a bubbling spring source that was therapeutic. And we know that in our own time, that certain pools, when there is a spa and a bubbling spring, can be therapeutic at times. But that's speculation as to what was going on here. Jesus didn't address the superstition. It's a, it's a lot, it ri- reminds me a lot of John chapter 3 when it seemed like Nicodemus had this long speech for Jesus. Oh, you, you, you're amazing. You must be of God and because no one could do what you do unless God is with him. And Jesus said, unless a man's born again, he shall not see, cannot enter the kingdom of God. He just cut to the chase and told him the truth. And Jesus didn't address the superstition. He just addressed the man and his need. And the amazing thing is that this man hasn't read John chapter 1, John chapter 2, John chapter 3, John chapter 4, and he's got no idea who it is he's speaking to. He's got no idea who Jesus is. No idea. This is huge. Ladies and gentlemen, this is huge because this man gets a miracle without faith. I was brought up that faith is the key. God is trying to get a miracle to you, but it's based on your faith. You've got to believe, and God is paralyzed. His, it's as if He's got this open sack, and He's shaking it, and He says, Can't you see I've done all I can do? It's now up to you to, on earth, receive what I've dropped from heaven. That was the idea. According to your faith, be it unto you. Now there are times when Jesus gives credit to faith, but not always. And here, how could there be faith when the guy doesn't even know who Jesus is? Faith is not some substance. It's not a feeling. It's belief in a person and his words. And that's what we need to see. The man had no faith because he didn't know who Jesus was. So faith's not a factor in his healing. Take that word of faith proponents. There it is. Verse 8. Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. The word pallet is not one we normally use, but it's speaking of a, a bed, a thin strip bed. It's not a bed that's comfortable by any means, but if you're lying around on city streets, it's better to have something rather than nothing. This was not a, an air mattress. This was a pallet and it was a small mat and it really just minimized the amount of dust he would lay in in the street. That's all it was for. Now, Jesus has not said a lot, but he said, do you want to get well? Listen to the response and then given him three commands. One, get up. Two, pick up your bed. Three, walk. There was no mention of who he was. There was not this protracted uh, interstatement, intercourse statement of, hey, I'm the Son of God. I've come down from heaven. I'm the Son of God. I've been doing miracles everywhere. I want to do something for you. I've got the power to do miracles. Do you believe that? None of that. None. Just get up, pick up your bed, walk. This miracle was not about the man's faith. He had none. This is about the sovereign compassion of Jesus. There were other people lying around. But Jesus healed this man. Not everyone else. There's no record that anyone else was affected by Jesus being there. Just one guy. Well, it's because he was open to God and he had faith. Uh, No, it was because Jesus had compassion on him. That's it. By this time, after 38 years of this condition, his limbs were useless. He could not raise his hand to say, I'm here. He could not raise his hand to say, I want a welcome packet. He was not able to do that. This is a picture of salvation, isn't it? When we're not seeking, when we're not believing, Jesus steps in. The Bible says in Romans 3 verse 11, there is no seeker after God. There is no God seeker, literally. If you're now seeking God, it's because God sought you. And Jesus sought this man. That's what's going to come out of the text. Jesus was looking for this man and to do what he was about to do on the Sabbath. 
When God had mercy on you and me as Christians and has said, let there be light into your soul, that's mercy. He didn't have to do it. And if you notice, He has not done that for everyone. When Peter in Matthew 16 was able to recognize Jesus and proclaim Him, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus said, you're blessed, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. So it is, if you know who Jesus is, God's been very merciful to you. Every Christian is a miracle. That's what 2 Corinthians 4 is all about. Just as God said, let there be light at the beginning, He said, let there be light shining in that man's heart, that woman's heart, that young child's heart. And so it is. And look at verse 9. does not say, after 17 months, something happened. But immediately... The man became well, picked up his pallet and began to walk. There was no gradual healing. And there is no gradual regeneration of the soul. When God the Holy Spirit comes and performs that divine act of mercy called the new birth, it happens instantly. We may not be aware of it. Some people look back and say, do you know when you were converted? And you say, Sometimes between, sometime between the age of 17 and 18, sometime between the age of 6 and 8, somewhere in there. Well, we may not know, but God knows that there was a definite moment when we passed from death to life, when the Holy Spirit invaded the heart, did divine surgery, and put out, took out a heart of stone, put in a heart of flesh. God knows the day and time. We don't need to know the time. We just need to obey the command to repent and believe, knowing that the only people who do that are those with new hearts. The great theologian from Australia, Crocodile Dundee, makes it very, very clear. As he was asking the tribal chief one day, how old he was. He got this reply. When was I born? The answer was, in the summertime. <laughs> That's not particularly useful, is it? He didn't know how old he was. But we don't go to him and say, you can't really be alive. You can't uh, be alive because you don't know the day of your birth. No, he must have had a birth because he's alive and he's well and he's functioning. And if you're a Christian, it's not because you can point to the day of your conversion, although it's great to be able to do so, but that's not the basis. There's nowhere in the New Testament that says, write it at the back of your papyrus, the day of your conversion, then you'll be saved. No, just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and those who do are converted. It's great if you can remember it, but Crocodile Dundee, the fictional character, was alive in the movie because he'd had a birth, even if he couldn't remember when it was. So it is for the Christian. When you're born again, you're born again. God knows the date. You may not. You may be very aware of the date. I remember the day of my conversion. May the 10th, 1980. I passed from death to life. Before that night, I wanted to be a soccer player. After that night, I wanted to be a preacher. And none of my friends understood. Still don't understand to this day. <laughs> Immediately. The man became well, picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now here's the kicker. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. Didn't Jesus know that? Sure he knew that. Why didn't Jesus come the day before? Why didn't he do this on a Tuesday? It would have been far, far less problematic. But Jesus chose to do it on this day. And that was the problem. See, Jesus is in command. He walks up to the guy, finds him, and does this miracle, not based on the man's faith, based on his sovereign mercy and compassion. And he could have done it the day before. He could have done it three weeks before. He could have done it at any afternoon. But he chose to do it on the Sabbath. Let me tell you this. Oh Lord, make me like Jesus. Do you really want God to answer that prayer? You may not end up like a wallflower. Oh, I'm a Christian. I, I, I never get upset at things. I just let people run over me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jesus wasn't like that. He knew this would cause issues with those who perver perverted God's law. And he did it anyway. It's as if he understood what would rile up the opposition more than anything. I could do this amazing miracle on a Tuesday, but I've got an idea. I'm going to do it on the day 
that's going to upset religionists. Yeah, that's a great idea. That's exactly what's happening here. There was a day to do business, but it wasn't the Sabbath. Jeremiah 17, 21 says this, Thus says the Lord, Take heed for yourselves, and do not carry any load on the Sabbath day, or bring anything in through the gates of Jerusalem. Now, the rabbis and the scribes had made a mountain out of that and said it means don't do anything on the Sabbath. No, it's referring to work, it's referring to commerce, it's referring to business. And it says don't, don't carry any load in the, in the sense of commerce, bringing it through the gates of Jerusalem. Don't be doing your normal activity of business on the Sabbath day in Israel. The Jews had added hundreds of stipulations to the law of God. The law of God said, don't do this. And the law of the men who were the rabbis made it this. Huge, huge things you can't do. Jesus loved the law of God. He hated man's religion and man's bondage. Let me just read this to you in Luke 6, verse 5. And he was saying to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. You know, if you're Lord of everything, you can do what you like on the Sabbath. Hmm. On another Sabbath, it says, Luke 6, 6, He entered the synagogue and was teaching, and there was a man who had, whose right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees were watching him closely to see if he healed on the Sabbath. And Jesus said to them, I am Jesus the wallflower, and I have chosen not to upset people, and therefore come back, O oh man, on Tuesday, and I will heal you. He could have said that. He didn't. <laughs> oh, they were watching so that they might find reason to, to accuse him. But he knew what they were thinking, and said to the man with the withered hand, come back next Tuesday. No, Get up, come forward. He got up, came forward, and Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good or do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or destroy it? After looking around them all, he said to him, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored, but they themselves were filled with rage and discussed together what they might do to Jesus. Mark 2, 27, Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus had no interest in the traditions of men. Don't you love Him? I love Him. He deliberately did what He did in John 5 on the Sabbath. He has no interest in rabbinic tradition. He loved God's law, not man's. Now, this miracle was a full, intentional full frontal attack on a religious system. Verse 10. John 5, 10. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, now the Jews here refers to the religious leaders, oftentimes that's the way it's used, in fact just about all the time in John's Gospel when it speaks of the Jews it's referring to the religious leaders. They were saying to the man who was cured, it is the Sabbath, it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. Well, he's not selling his pallet. He's not doing business with his pallet. He's walking home with his pallet because Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, healed him and said, pick up your pallet and walk. Verse 11. But he answered them, He who made me well was the one who said to me, pick up your pallet and walk. In other words, hey, I'm, I'm just doing what I'm told. Verse 12. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, pick up your pallet and walk? Now, the Jewish leaders had no interest in the man's welfare. They never asked him, how long had you been in your condition? Wow, it's an amazing miracle. They had no interest. They were just upset because their man-made laws were being violated. Verse 13, but the man who was healed did not know who it was. Even at this point, he still doesn't know. So Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Again, faith was not a factor because the man had no idea who'd healed him. Jesus and his compassion's what's on view here, not the man and his faith. Verse 14. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you've become well. Now, isn't that interesting? Jesus found him. There's thousands of people 
uh, in the area because of the feast, but Jesus found him. Was that luck? No, he found him because he knows everything and guess what? He knows you, he knows where you are and he can find you. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you've become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. He found the man. He knew where he was. He knows who you are. And he knows where you are in a spiritual condition. And he says to the man, You've become well. Now go live a different life from the one you had. It's a lot like us who've become Christians. We now have a new nature. And we are to glorify God because of the mercy we've received. God has a purpose for our bodies, whether they be sick or whether they're healed. We're to glorify God with our bodies. Romans 12 says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a holy, living sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, those words in the text, you've become well, do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you, has an implication in those words. Sometimes we are sick as a result of sin, which seems to be, seems to be the implication here. In other words, your 38-year health problems were the result of personal sin. Now, don't do that which you were doing, lest something worse happens. It's not explicit in the text, it's not stated exactly, but it seems to be the implication. But later on in John's Gospel, we have the man born blind who was healed. And it's definitely not the fact that he was in that condition because of his personal sin or that of his parents. Let me read John chapter 9, verse 1. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And, Jesus and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? You see, that was the thought. If someone's sick, if someone's blind, there must have been sin involved. Many people have that idea. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he'd be born blind? Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned, nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. You see, sin is in the world. Sin has consequences. We live in a fallen world. Many people are born in a very sick condition. But it's not because of personal sin. But there are times that personal sin does have consequences, but it's not necessarily the case. Our job is not to try and find out what God knows on these things. Our job is to help people. Our job is... When we find someone in the ditch, not to give someone a theological lecture as to why they find themselves in the ditch, but to help them out of the ditch. Right? You are here because of these seven reasons. Let me show you the prominence of my knowledge that you may know. No, help them out. They may be interested in a Bible study later. Just help them out right now. They're in a ditch. <laughs> I have brought eight people with me for this Bible study. Just lay there and I will uh, sh confirm the height of my knowledge. You're, you're comfortable? No? No? Let me out. Uh, no, it, it's okay. We've got some amazing Bible study for you. That's not going to help. If we find someone in a ditch, it's not helpful to tell them how deep the ditch is. The fact that not many people get out of the ditch. Uh, there's slime on either, uh, both sides of the ditch. Uh, staying there would not be good for you. No, just get them out of the ditch. And Jesus here is telling the man, go leave the life of sin. And this is really what repentance is, isn't it? it repentance is in action, forsaking the former life. We're saying no to the old, saying yes to the will of God. Verse 15, the man went away. Now notice this, very interesting. And told the Jews, that's again, the Jewish leaders, that it was Jesus who'd made him well. What's going on here? He's healed. He's got up. He's obeyed Jesus. He's taken up his pallet, his bed, and he's walked. Where has he walked? Well, it looks like he's walked to where the Jewish leaders were. And he told them it was Jesus who made him well. He wasn't sure. Now he knows, and he's gone to tell them. There are two options here. Number one, he just had to tell the story, despite the consequences. I've got to tell somebody. 
as the old song says. I've got to tell somebody what Jesus did for me. That could be one of the options. It could be that he's brave here. He knew the hostility of the Jewish leaders and he was going to take them on. Take that, Jewish leaders. Jesus healed me. Could be. Option two is this. That in spite of his healing, in spite of this amazing miracle, he was still siding with the Jewish leaders and turned Jesus in. Which is it? I have listened to some people and they are very sure of the answer. As I've studied this, the mystery has only deepened for me because I can't find the answer in the text. I don't know. You mean you studied this and you don't know? Yep, I've studied it. Here's what I've come to you after hours of study. I don't know. I don't know if it's option one. He had to tell the story. He was brave. Or option number two. He was as hostile to Jesus as the religious leaders and turned him in. Was this a betrayal or a testimony? Hmm. How can someone healed by Jesus turn on Jesus? That's really the th question that arises from... He's been, he's been 38 years in this condition and he turns on Jesus. Is that likely? Well, just remember, multitudes had been healed by Jesus. I think many of the crowds who lined the streets of Jerusalem saying, crucify him, crucify him, what percentage of them had been healed by Jesus? We don't know, but I think some of them, Jesus was healing everyone. Acts 10, 38. He went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. It could be that these people had received healing from Jesus, but then turned on Jesus. You see, we can't see the heart motivation of a man or a woman or a boy or a girl. And this is actually helpful in relationships because we can observe actions, but we don't always know the motivation of the heart. The only reason that you're doing this is that, 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 that. No, you have no right to say that, 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 unless it becomes obvious it is that, 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 that. Well, I just believe you're doing this for this reason. Now, it could be true. But all you and I can do is observe the actions of a person. We don't know heart motivations. But here's what I do know. Verse 16. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. This triggered, as I say, intense opposition to Jesus. They were already infuriated with what he did at the temple turning over the tables of the money changers. Now this was going too far. Healing on the Sabbath. And verse 17. Oh. But he answered them. That's the Jewish leaders. My father is working until now and I myself am working. There are massive implications in these words. We're going to see throughout John chapter 5, Jesus unveiling his identity over and over and over again to people who didn't want to know. What's he saying? God's at work and I'm at work. He and I are working. This was an absolute claim of divinity. He's calling himself the Son of God here. My Father is working, that's God, and I'm working. His claim of divinity was not lost on those who heard it. He's saying, my father is God. My father is not Joseph the carpenter. My father's God. He and I are working together. Do you know in a Jewish bar mitzvah, when a young boy is becoming a man at that ceremony, usually around the age of 12, around that time, the day after the bar mitzvah, what normally happens is, the young Jew, now proclaimed to be a man, starts working in his father's business. And it was the expectation of the family, wasn't it, that after the bar mitzvah, Jesus would go back with the family to where Joseph was and start working in the carpenter's shop. But you know the story. 
Joseph thought he must be with Mary. Mary thought he must be with Joseph. There was this big, huge family and somehow Jesus was lost in the midst of it. They had to go back looking for Jesus. They looked everywhere, couldn't find him. Eventually, they found him where? In the temple. And what was his response? He ended up going with his family, but he started by saying this. Why were you looking for me? Did you not know I had to be about my father's business? I just had my bar mitzvah. It's time for me to start working in the family business. I'm in the temple teaching the Word of God. Whoa. And they hid those things in their hearts. They realized Jesus knew exactly who he was. Hey, it's the day after my bar mitzvah. I've been waiting for this. I'm in the temple doing what everyone should do. The work of their father. And now he's saying, the father's working and I'm working. Powerful stuff. Look at verse 18. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he was not only breaking the Sabbath in their minds. He was not breaking the Sabbath. He was breaking the man-made laws about the Sabbath, but was also calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. They knew exactly what he was doing. Just as the son does the work of the carpenter, if that's what the father is, I'm doing the work of my father doing miracles. They caught the connection. Jesus was claiming to be God, the son of his father, the son of God. Now for us, for you, for me, hear the claims of Jesus from his own lips. What will you do? Who will you side with? I don't know where this man was. I don't see his heart. We'd have to ask God when we get to heaven, where was his heart in all this? I don't know. We just look at the text. It doesn't look good. I kind of lean towards the idea that he was giving Jesus up to the religious leaders, but I don't know. But what I do know is Jesus was Lord of this situation. And the question for you and me is, who will you side with? The traditions of man or the Word of God? The way of salvation or the road to hell? Proverbs 14.12 says this, There is a way which seems right to a man, but in its end, it's the way of death. Well, it's not like that, Pastor. What has Jesus done for me? Well, if you've been reading John chapter 1, you wouldn't got, have gotten past the first chapter without realizing Jesus is the creator of everything. Jesus created the stars. Jesus created the earth, the sand, the wind, the storms. Jesus is Lord of everything. He's made everything. He's holding you together. He's holding your brain cells together even as you defy Him. What has Jesus done for me lately? You live in Him. In Him we live and move and have our being. He's holding you together in your defiance of Him. That's powerful stuff. He's the Creator. He's your Creator. And He's the sustainer of everything. That's the person of Jesus. He's Lord of the Sabbath. Is He your Lord? Have you sided with Him? Have you come under His tutelage? Have you learned of Him? Have you become His disciples? Disciple, there is no other option. There's no neutrality. We're either for Him, He said, or we're against Him. My word to you is, repent and believe the good news. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one who is eternally with His Father, the eternal Word, who was God, who was with God, has now become flesh, living a sinless life, dying an atoning death for everyone who would ever believe in Him, raising again from the dead, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father in the place of all authority. And on that basis, He says, to come into my kingdom, you must come under my rule. Repent, believe the good news that I'm willing to justify you, forgive you, and give you my righteousness as a gift. Don't bring anything in your hands except the sin that made my sacrifice possible. Recognizing your sin, coming to Christ and saying, Be Lord, forgive me. Come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. And guess what? He will. Choose this day who you will serve. This Jesus or something else. Knowing this, only Jesus can save. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Strong words of Jesus. For the religious leaders and for us, may we recognize who this Jesus is. Come under his rule. Pray in Christ's name. Amen.